Good afternoon, Mr. Dossio. Uh, good afternoon, Chief Justice. Are you well, sir? I'm very well. I hope you're well too. I'm very well, thank you. Um, you were prosecutor, district court magistrate, regional court magistrate. Um, give us the total number of years over which you were a prosecutor and then magistrate, both district and regional. Um, I've been in the profession for 30 years, Chief Justice. Well, for how many years as a prosecutor and for how many years as a magistrate? It was five years as a public prosecutor, five years as a district magistrate, and it's 20 years as a regional magistrate, of which um, basically 11 and a half, 12 years were in the criminal regional court, and the remaining uh, basically seven and a half, eight years were in the civil regional court in Johannesburg. Yes. And. Um, for how many terms have you acted as a, as a high court judge? Well, in total now, it's uh, about 17 months and about two weeks. I've served quite a few full terms and then intermittently for five week periods at a time, um, either in the criminal or in the civil division. Thank you. Uh, um, colleagues, may I have your names, please? Those who have questions. All right. Yeah, JP? Yeah, I'm oh, okay. All right. And Commissioner Schlimmer as well, please. Muima. Mateo Jeco. Maya. Over to you, JP. Thank you very much, Chief Justice. Um, Mr. Dosio, you've given me quite a lot of your time to come and act in the division since 2013, and I thank you for that. And uh, you, you are what one calls a well-rounded magistrate, am I correct? I think I am. In the sense that you've dealt with criminal matters as well as civil matters. That's quite correct, JP. Right. And that what that is borne out by is the spreadsheet of work allocations, which shows you've acted for 70 weeks, seven zero That's in the correct. division. And you've done your fair share of heavy lifting work, especially in opposed motions. You've done six full weeks there. That's correct. The full court matters, full court appeals you've set in. Have you written any of those judgments there? Well, JP, in, in all the five weeks that I did sit, uh, for those weeks, I did write every single one of the full bench. Two were criminal, two were civil. Yes. Um, and uh, you, you spent quite some time in criminal trial, in the criminal trial court. And uh, am I correct that you are one of those acting judges who've never had big problems in finalizing your criminal trials? in the High Court? Not at all, JP. I think 51 judgments I handed down in the criminal court, which were mostly trials. Yes. And um, I think it was just basically trying to expedite the matter and trying to speak to the council. Let's try and get this done as soon as possible. Yes. And uh, looking at the list of judgments that uh, you've submitted, which you've written since you started acting, um, they traverse a wide spectrum uh, of areas of law. Any particular work area in the high court work areas that gives you problems? Um, I think um, over the years I've been very fortunate in that you've allowed me to give to have quite an all-rounded experience in admin law, commercial, family, uh, delict, uh, criminal, constitutional, so I think I've been exposed to an all-rounded area. Yes. And uh, do you have any judgments that you've uh, reserved for longer than six months? I, I, my judgments are always handed down uh, in, a, in an expeditious manner, with the exception of one, JP. Uh, this came to me by way of a special opposed motion, which was a three-day special opposed motion. It was a short over the six months. 
The reason is just purely that it was a matter that entailed constitutional principles and I needed to basically declare many sections of the 2018 City of Johannesburg Municipality Bylaws as unconstitutional. Yeah. And I spent time working on that judgment just purely because I knew it would go to the Supreme Court of Appeal and to the Constitutional Court and it needed to be a very uh, well-researched judgment. Yes. Um, one last question, CJ. Um, Section 8 of the Superior Courts Act gives certain responsibilities to the JP of a division in which a regional court falls. You are a regional court magistrate. Correct. Um, what is your attitude to that responsibility being given to the judge president in relation to the regional court? And uh, the background of this question is the backlogs that one sees in terms of the finalization of criminal trials in the regional court. Every province, you can look at every PEEC report, every province is not doing well in that regard from the regional court perspective. So I'm going back to the question I asked. You want to be a judge, you're a regional magistrate. What is, uh, do, do you think there's a role that the judge president can play to expedite matters, I presume, yes. in the criminal courts. Yes. Well, in the regional court. In the regional court. Well, first of all, in the regional court, we do not have this continuous role, which is, I believe, an impediment in finalizing matters expeditiously. In the high court, matters are set down for five days, 10 days, 15 days, and counsel are ready to proceed with those matters almost uh, in a consecutive um, procedure. But in the regional court, it's slightly different in that council obviously take on quite a few matters and they may only book one day or two days to hear these matters and then they have to postpone it for when they're available again. So if the, if the a judge president in some way, and I, I don't quite have the answer how that could be done, but if this could be implemented in the regional court to have a form of a continuous role I think this will help immensely in the sense that the council who are dedicated to hear these matters will know you have this number of days, finish the matter. So yes. I think the oversight that the judge president has over regional matters is important because it can bring a wealth of knowledge from the high court to the regional court. Okay, thank, thank you very much, Chief Justice. No questions. Thank you, JP. MEC? Thanks so much, Chief Justice. I'm covered. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, MEC. Uh, Honorable Nyambi? Uh, afternoon. Good afternoon, Honorable Nyambi. If you can share with us uh, three good attributes of a, a judge and those that you think you possess that will come handy to assist you if you can be given the responsibility. Well, I think integrity is most important. You're obviously there to uphold the law and people are going to be watching you. You need to have a lot of patience. You need to have a lot of fortitude. Naturally, some form of wisdom because these judgments sometimes are difficult. And you need to be able to also work quickly uh, in the sense of encouraging counsel to bring these matters to an end as soon as possible. Partiality is important. Judicial accountability is important. Sorry, giving you more than three. Sorry about that. So you possess all those that you have mentioned? I, over 30 years, I do possess those. I think I have. Thank you. Thank you, CJ. Thank you. Much appreciated, Honorable Nyambi. Prof? Thank you, CJ. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Chris. Um, could you tell us what your judicial philosophy is, please? Well, I obviously apply the common law, statutory law, customary law, but always within the parameters and ambit of the constitution. Obviously, there's a lot of schools of thought, whether you're liberal, moderate, or conservative. I think every matter needs to be considered on its merits. But I always look at the law, 
I don't just apply it as it is. It has to be applied within the ambit of the Constitution. That's my philosophy. Thank you. And your view of or your understanding of the rule of law? Well, the rule of law is that no one is above the law. So be it a president, be it a person of authority, the law is there to govern everyone, irrespective of your position. And obviously, the rule of law, in a way, forms part and parcel with the separation of powers in the sense that the rule of law also, to a certain extent, needs to be guarded to control those borders. Thank you very much. Thanks, CJ. Thank you, Priscilla. CJ, could I have a follow-up? Yes, please. Thank you, CJ. Good morning, Judge. Good morning. Just on your um, on the, the the issue that uh, Prof asked um, uh, uh, relating to your judicial uh, philosophy and how you answered that all of this uh, in in when you when you apply or, or or interpret any of these laws, you do it within the ambit of the constitution. Could you give us example of some of your judgments where this would have been done? Well, first of all. I had a very important judgment, which was S. Mohramedi, which was of a uh, traditional healer who killed his sister to complete the uh, initiation period to become a traditional uh, healer. And the charge was murder, and it was a gender-based violence matter. And when it came to sentence, the sentence imposed by single judge was life imprisonment. It came to us in the form of um, compelling and substantial reasons to impose a lesser sentence and life. And notwithstanding the provisions of section 13 of the constitution, uh, sorry, 31 of the constitution that allows the preservation of your religious and cultural rights, I penned that full court judgment and looked at the provisions of section 10, which preserves the dignity of the person, and Section 11 of the Bill of Rights, which preserves the right to life. And I found that that uh, superseded the uh, preservation of religious and cultural beliefs. And in the other judgment that I penned, which was the, full, uh, the special opposed motion, well, there, there were a lot of issues that were because I declared it unconstitutional, I had to consider issues pertaining to Section 16 of the Bill of Rights, the right to freedom of expression and related to billboards and, and advertisement signs. I had to consider Section 25, which dealt the right to freedom of the property. And numerous issues in that special opposed motion were considered, which all form part of the Bill of Rights. And I think in my regional court work, the Bill of Rights always takes a very predominant role, specifically with child witnesses, because Section 28 is paramount, and it's important that when we have child witnesses testifying in sexual offences, I always ensure that their interests are upheld, and that if they are given the opportunity, that they are given a very safe environment to testify in with the closed circuit television cameras. And obviously you balance that with the interests of the accused in section 35, but I always consider the interests of the children foremost. And yeah, so it's quite Thank a few. <laughs> yes, but that's, that's enough for now. Thank you, Thank Judge. You. Thank you, CJ. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Honorable uh, Muima. Thank, thank you, Chief Justice. Good morning, Justice. Morning, uh, Honorable Mama. The uh, question that I want to pose relates to, to uh, putting us at ease in terms of uh, uh, reasons that you can advance uh, around uh, a matter where you said with Jatun uh, Simegi, uh, oh. uh, you refuse leave to appeal but the Supreme Court of Appeal uh, <clears throat> uh, set aside the, the, uh, the sentence because the state uh, misdirected itself to the three pre-sentencing reports. Uh, 
how 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 did that escape the i'll explain the this was a petition so it was decided in chambers by myself and judge mc making we read the record we discussed it the regional court did not uh, consider the correctional supervision reports and the sentence was uh, eight years imprisonment we felt it was an appropriate sentence the judgment was taken on appeal to the supreme court of appeal and the supreme court of appeal held that the regional court had misdirected itself for not having heard evidence of the three correctional supervision reports so it sent it back to the high court of gauteng so that new evidence could be led and that's how that arose thank you chief justice thank you judge pleasure commissioner Thank you, Honorable Moema. Uh, Commissioner Zepo. Uh, th thank you, Chief Justice, and good afternoon, uh, Good Judge. afternoon, Commissioner Zepo. I just see that one of the, the parties, the organization that supported your application is the African Diaspora Forum. And the reason I'm, I'm, I wanted to, to tap into you, and I understand that you were, according to them, you are one of the Board of Trustees in 2017. What I wanted to find out from you, where the, the met, have you had a lot of matters that deals with immigration or refugee laws or asylum seeking coming before you? Or was it, were you just their advisor? I'm, I'm trying to, to... I'll explain to you the situation. There has been one or two in the unopposed role that have appeared before me, but predominantly I, feel quite strongly about xenophobia and Afrophobia. I just felt that I could impart some of my knowledge to assist in helping the, the director of the African diaspora. There were many cases where people were assaulted. They had no avenue where to go, um, how to approach police stations. And with, with the fact that the Refugees Act and Asylum Act are so important, I, I try to impart my knowledge that I have in respect to those particular acts to assist them further to try and expedite and ameliorate the finalization of those cases. So it was purely in an advisory capacity that I assisted and predominantly that's all I really did. Um, there were also some issues where gender-based violence raised its ugly head and I tried to assist with my knowledge of being in Soweto for 12 years, how to approach the relevant police station, what they needed to do, had they been taken to the Tutuzela clinic, had these uh, victims been properly counseled. So it was basically imparting knowledge that I had from, from an experiential point of view. I hope that answers the question. Yes, so I follow up. I just, uh, I'm just interested in finding out whether the issues that we have with the African diaspora, is it because there's something lacking in our legislation or is just how we apply the legislation to us African diaspora? Xenophobia is not per se a crime, but the aspects that arise out of this are of criminal um, intent. The, the police can only do as much as they can I do believe that there's a bill which is the prevention and combating of hate speech and hate crimes. This was a bill which was created and it addresses quite sufficiently and in detail the aspects pertaining to discrimination uh, more and above than what is included in the Constitution. Namely, it deals with the refugee uh, aspect, migrant status, albinism, HIV, um, discrimination. So I've been a strong proponent that if that bill could be put into operation, I think it would ameliorate and try and assist to curb this unfortunate um, hate crime that is committed. Thank you, Chief Justice, and thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Kipo. Thank you, Honorable uh, uh, President Maya. Good afternoon, Mr. Tosio. 
Good afternoon, President Maya. In addition to being an artist and a great cook, we told, I know from our interactions in the Association of Women Judges, of which you are a long standing member, that you are a committed gender activist with a particular interest in vulnerable youth. Can you tell us a little bit, very briefly, about the mentoring work you do with law students? and the gender-based violence projects in which you are involved. Uh, President Maya, this stems back many years ago when I started in Soweto in 2000. I had obviously public prosecutors who were black females and um, legal aid black females who appeared before me and I saw their potential, tried to encourage them to pursue becoming magistrates, becoming advocates which ultimately they all have become exactly that. But in addition, the IAWJ, the South African chapter of which I was there in 2004 when it was formed uh, under the then uh, President Thabo Mbeki, we created, and it's a team that we worked together, a, a forum where we have mentored 100 students in, 2000, in, one, in 2018 150 students in 2019 and about 160 students in 2020. Uh, 2020 was a little bit more difficult in the sense with COVID, but we had a Saturday afternoon on the couch session, which we did virtually, where we invited a lot of prominent uh, female members, judges from the Supreme Court of Appeal, attorneys, female attorneys, female advocates. We even had Tembeka Ngaitubi who told us about the transformation issues, that females need to be briefed more on commercial matters, black females, and all this assisted to try and give some kind of input to demystifying the whole legal profession to these um, final year female LLB students. I must say, apart from the female students I was given to mentor, also had a male black student, uh, and I need to mention his name, Andile Tuli, and he actually has learned a lot from this process, and he himself has now started to brief young black uh, advocates in matters. So it's a matter of changing mindsets. And um, mm -hmm. regarding the gender-based violence, we unfortunately could not proceed as we intended in 2020 with COVID, but we have a project in place whereby we do hope uh, to go to the various schools and allow the children to participate and give their points of view regarding gender-based violence. The, the project hopefully will start soon. We have other options to do it virtually and um, this is a proposal that we are working on at the moment. Thank you very much, Mr. Preso. Thank you, CJ. Thank you, President Maya. Thank you, thank you, Honorable President. Um, colleagues, are we not taking a lunch break now? I would propose that um, we, we take a lunch break now, yes. and I assume it will still be for the usual 40 minutes. Uh, you're excused, uh, uh, Mr. Dosio. Thank you, Chief Justice. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much.